Hello and welcome to our session today. Today we are going to look at antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, this is a continuation of our pharmacological uh, pharmacology series and uh, the ECG lectures. So in the ECG we were able to look at the different abnormal heart rhythms. So here we are going to specifically look at the treatment. Of course for the abnormal um, Abnormal heart rhythms, uh, most of them are tachycardia, okay? They are tachycardia, so that's what we are going to really concentrate on in this, uh, in this lecture. Uh, uh, Anti-arrhythmic drugs can simply be defined as drugs or medications which are used to treat abnormal heart rhythms, which could be uh, any form of tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillations. Uh, we have already looked at this uh, uh, abnormal, at the in, including um, dosadis de pointes, all right? Guys, if you are not familiar with it, you can look at the link for the ventricular arrhythmias, all right? Okay, so in this case, these drugs work by affecting the electrical impulses in the heart, so they help restore normal uh, heart rhythm and even prevent arrhythmias from occurring. Uh, the heart conduction system is the one that is normally responsible for generating and transmitting electrical impulses that will be regulating the heart rhythm, so, uh, and so it could it coordinate its contraction. You know that these electrical signals will normally originate from the sinoatrial node, and this sinoatrial node is located in the right atrium, okay, in the right atrium. Then they are uh, passed through or travel towards the AV node, the atrioventricular node, then to the bundle, then to the branches, and lastly to the Purkinje fibers. So this process of the heart conduction is divided actually into four phases, where we have uh, phase zero, a uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and four. Actually, we could say five, all right, uh, just because we start with zero. And phase zero is actually all about depolarization, okay, contraction. So in phase zero, the cardiac cells normally start contracting, that's depolarizing. So this phase is characterized by usually by the rap rapid influx of sodium, channels okay sodium ions are uh, influxing in getting into the cardiac cells and this leads to a rise in membrane potential so the influx of sodium ions uh, occurs due to the opening of these fast sodium channels which allow sodiums to uh, to get into the cells and this causes depolarization this normally leads to a change in the membrane potential some, uh, especially some scientists will say from around negative 70 millivolts to around a positive of 50, all right? So in this case, uh, this phase zero, it normally initiates the action potential that triggers contraction of cardiac, cardiac muscle fibers, all right? So remember we have phase zero where the sodium channels, uh, the first sodium channels have opened and sodium will rush into the cardiac cells, okay? And this will lead to rise in a membrane, a membrane potential. So this ushers in phase one uh, where there is early repolarization and uh, phase one simply follows the phase zero and this one is characterized by a partial repolarization of the cardiac um, uh, cardiac cells. So we have, um, in this case, we normally have transient outflow of uh, potassium, um, potassium ions out of the cells. And this leads to a brief decrease in membrane potential. So remember, we started with what? Phase zero, where we are depolarizing. Um, uh -huh. And then we have gotten now to phase zero, where the sodium channels have closed. And now what is happening? There is an outward flow of calcium, right? The outward flow of calcium. So the out outward flow of potassium, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. So this phase Phase one normally prepares cardiac uh, cells for subsequent phases of cell action, action potential. 
Then that ushers phase two, which is uh, commonly referred to as the plateau. It's plateau because it is relatively a prolonged phase that is characterized by balance between inward and outward currents. And this res normally results in a fairly stable membrane potentials. So during this phase, we have calcium ions, which normally enter the cells through this slow calcium channel. We refer to them as the L-type calcium channel while potassium ions continue to flow out of the cell, right? So the influx of calcium ions contributes to the sustained depolarization, contraction of cardiac um, cells, and this prolonging the action potential and allowing for sustained contraction of muscle fibers. All right, guys, if I started with phase zero, where we are depolarizing, sodium is getting into the cells, and then you have phase one, um, the, the, the sodium channels have just closed, and we now have an output of potassium, Potassium, and then now we now go to now to the plateau, which is a flat phase where we continue. Calcium gets in, so when calcium gets in, it means we'll continue with the contractions. Okay, we'll continue with the contraction while potassium ions continue to flow out. So that gives ashes in the phase three which is all about repolarization. So repolarization of cardiac muscles will happen, leading to return to the resting membrane potential. So this repolarization occurs primarily due to the efflux of potassium ions out of the cell through delayed um, through late like, like, fire uh, potassium channel and this leads to restoration of cells negative charge. So guys, we started with the phase zero, uh, depolarizing, and then uh, phase one, the voltage, uh, voltage gated sodium channels have closed, and the voltage gated uh, potassium channels begin to open. So potassium starts going out. Okay, phase two, we say that uh, there is a plateau, so it's kind of a flat. Okay, so the voltage gated sodium channels will open. So calcium gets in. So when calcium gets in, the contraction continues. Contraction continues. At the same time, you have potassium efflux. So potassium continues to get outside the cell. So myocytes are still contracting. And then at phase three, now we have rapid repolarization. So the voltage gated sodium channels, we, uh, calcium channels will close at. Um, stage at phase three so when it closes it means the contraction will reduce okay because con um, calcium is all about the contractions right so the slow voltage gated uh, potassium channels will open all right will open at uh, this at, at this moment all right and this means now that is going to lead to repolarization okay repolarization so that gives us to phase four and phase four is simply the resting potential it represents the resting phase of a cardiac action potential so that during this phase the membrane potential of the cardiac cells is relatively stable and maintained at a negative value as before the resting potential is maintained by the balance between the inward and the outward movement of ions across the cell membrane primarily through the sodium uh, through the ion channels uh, such as the sodium pump and some of the leaky channels for the calcium all right so that is what we have all about the four five phases of the conduction so based on this one, we had the vaughan william classifications. It's able to classify all the antirhythmic drugs into four major classes based on their mode of mechanism. Where we have class 1, which is all about the sodium channel blockers. We have class A, class B, and class C. Followed by the potassium, the beta blockers. The beta blockers, these are the class 2. And then third is the class 3, which is consist of the potassium channel blockers. And then lastly, class 4, which consists of the calcium and um, <clears throat> the calcium channel blockers. So you can be able to see here, like the class 1, they majorly work on the phase 0 right on the phase zero class two uh, majorly work on the phase four of the contraction 
and then class three about this um, the phase three for the classification this is all about potassium channel blockers like the amiodarum and then now we have the class four class four the calcium channel blockers which are working majorly on the phase two so those are the different drugs and that's why it's important for us to look at the different phases of conduction so that we can be able to appreciate these antirhythmic drugs all right so let's start with the class one okay and the class one are sodium channel blockers we have said they work majorly on phase zero right on phase zero these drugs work by blocking sodium channels in the heart cells so which helps to slow down the conduction you know in phase zero you know we, want, we normally have contraction by getting in the sodium channel so once we block them then sodium is not able to get into the cells so this can block also these drugs can also block the potassium uh, increasing also the repolarization stage all right so in all these class one there's an antirhythmic drugs that block the fast sodium channel okay all of them they decrease they work by decreasing the slope of the phase zero all right phase of zero so based on that we can simply classify these drugs again starting with c so that we start with the class c followed by class a followed by class b in that we are saying that class c it is the best class of antirhythmic more so the sodium channel blockers that is as good at especially decreasing the slope of phase zero right phase zero okay so it decreases the, the slope of phase zero okay it's very good at this the only problem with this uh, class c is that um uh, they cannot be used post mi myocardial infarction or in ischemic tissues all right so that makes us to go to uh, class a and uh, class a they are moderate in decreasing the slope of phase zero all right oh okay the only problem is that they will prolong the qrs on the ekg then class b now are the least uh, the least in decreasing that slope for the that slope for phase zero, right? That slope of phase zero, they are the least. But however, they are the best and they can be used actually post MI, okay? Examples include lidocaine, okay, phenytoin. So they don't prolong the QRS on the EKG. They may shorten the QOT interval, all right? While these other two could prolong the, e the QRS on the EKG. So all these are the sodium channel blockers. It's just good if we start by looking at the first subclass of this group. So we'll allow us to start with A, all right? Or, or they, it, or, 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 of course, when you're trying to look at in, in terms of the impact on slowing or decreasing the slope, this comes number two okay but we are starting with a because it's the oldest group of antirhythmic drugs and they are still in use all right they have moderate uh, medium uh, sodium channel blocking effect and they can also affect this the potassium channels prolonging the action potential so these agents in this class also cause decreased conductivity and increased refractoriness and this is because of what affecting the potassium channel blood potassium channels okay examples we have quinidine uh, we have also have procainamide and the disopyramide okay some of the side effects associated with these drugs which is so important for us to know is like for example the quinidine uh, currently is not recommended and it's associated with the synchronism all right while the pro uh, the procaminamide is associated with drug induced systemic lupus erythromatosus the last one is associated with the dosades depointes okay the dosades depointes all right so those are some of the uh, facts that you need to know about class 1a what about class 1b class 1b uh, of course, we have said that they are least important in slowing the phase zero, all right? But they can be used in ischemic tissues, all right? So we have examples of this class 1B, like the lidocaine, the todocaine, the phenytoin, the mesilatin, okay? So we normally use the mnemonic lettuce, tomato, pickles, mayo. So 
it can also be able to give us all these drugs, all right? If you try to look at the characteristics class B, all right, in terms of depolarization rate, conduction velocity, uh, effective refractory period, action potential duration, automaticity, um, the, the duration, the QRAs, the QT, you find that there is no effect, they're decreased in all aspects okay no wonder we are saying that they are the least in slowing the phase zero okay so this class of anti-arrhythmic they they of course they can be used to treat uh, ventricular arrhythmias by weakly blocking the sodium channels and decreasing action uh, action action potential uh, duration right that takes us to class C. Uh, still, these are still sodium channel blockers, okay? These drugs have potent sodium uh, channel blocking effects and are used primarily to treat supraventricular arrhythmias. They are best, but they can't be used in ischemic tissues, all right? Examples include FLE, flecanide, and proper feminine. Okay, the, uh, these two examples, okay, they decrease conductivity, but they have minimal effect on act uh, action potential duration. So the class C agents have the most potential channel blocking effects. No wonder we normally talk of CAB, right? We normally talk of CAB, okay, meaning that class C are the are they're the ones that have their potent sodium channel blocking effect, followed by class A, 1A, and then lastly, 1B. All right? Okay, guys, that takes us to class 2. Class 2 antiarrhythmic drugs. And here we have said they are beta adrenergic blockers. All right? They work by competitive inhibition. All right? Inhibition, where they block the effects of adrenaline. Okay, epinephrine. So epinephrine is produced, it is not able to attach their re the receptors, okay, because the beta blockers have done the same. They have attached, of course, okay, so this competitive inhibition. So for, by reducing this heart rate and slowing down the conduction through the AV node, they can help prevent certain types of arrhythmias, particularly those that are triggered by sympathetic nervous stimulation. Right. So these drugs, when you look at the uh, the conduction system, they majorly decrease the slope of uh, phase four. Okay, depolarizing by just suppressing the AV and the senior uh, atrial nodal activity, and they are particularly important in atrial fibrillation. Examples include the meta metoprolol. Pronolol, atenolol, okay? These are all beta blockers. Guys, if you have more, if you need more information about this drug, you can add, uh, you can approach the link on the beta blockers so that you can even be able to know the cardio selective and non-selective. Propranolol, for example, is a non-selective, all right? So it has effective and arrhythmic activity is well tolerated and documented to reduce mortality after acute myocardial infarction by reducing arrhythmias. They normally decrease slope or slope 4 uh, repolarization and they prolong repolarization at AV node. Okay, okay, so those are some of the uh, some of the examples of the beta blockers. We can also use the above link to get more information about beta adrenergic blockers, which are considered class 2 anti arrhythmic drugs. Okay, guys, we can now look at now the class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs and these are potassium channel blockers what do they do they prolong the duration of the action potential and the refractory period so actually they work on phase what on phase three okay which is all about repolarization examples are amiodarone ibutanide uh, dofetibide and sotalol we can actually use the aids mnemonic to remember these drugs okay great guys these drugs they stabilize the heart's electrical activity and prevent re-entry arrhythmias okay so they will prolong the phase three so this is the phase three they are going to prolong and when they prolong it's going to take more time all right more time guys all right more time guys if you try to draw if you try to draw that 
Amiodarum is one of the drugs that are a class 3. So it, in terms of classification, it's a class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. It works by exhibiting, okay, exhibiting multiple mechanisms of action, including blocking uh, potassium channels, calcium channels and adrenergic receptor and this leads to prolongation of the action potential duration and refractoriness of the cardiac tissues and in the clinical practice amiodarum is used to treat various types of arrhythmias including ventricular arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation and atrial arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter it's majorly administered orally or intravenously with different dosing regimens depending on the indication and the route of administration. Amiodarum comes in with some side effects, for example, the pulmonary toxicity such as intestinal pneumonitis or pulmonary fibrosis. Thyroid dysfunction, where it's affecting the TSH, so person may end up with either hypo or hyperthyroidism. We also have liver toxicity, photosensitivity, and corneal microdeposits. Long-term use of amiodarum has been associated with skin discoloration, which is normally commonly referred to as the blue-gray discoloration. So you have to do regular monitoring of the pulmonary function test, the thyroid function test, the liver function test, ophthalmic exams, which is very necessary due to the potential side effects of this uh, drug. You find that amiodarum, it's a, a CYP3A4 uh, inhibitor, guys. So in this case, uh, it will increase the side effect of these drugs that are normally metabolized by this by this group of enzymes all right all right guys that takes us to uh, class four and class four and the arrhythmic drugs are the calcium channel blockers these drugs simply work by blocking calcium channel blockers uh, channels in the heart cells leading to a decreased conduction velocity and automaticity they are particularly important in treating supraventricular arrhythmias by slowing down conduction through the av node so when you stop calcium from entering the cells of the heart and the arteries they can cause heart and arteries to squeeze more slowly by blocking calcium by blocking calcium now calcium channel blockers will allow this blood vessels to relax and to open right so the supraventricular tachycardia for that case so generally the class four um the class four they will increase the they will prolong the repolarization interval at the av node so these drugs they majorly decrease the slope of several phases we have phase zero uh, also phase three and phase four. So they are the prolonged polarization by the AV node, uh, node phase. And therefore these drugs are very particularly important in atrial fibrillation. We have two major examples here, which are the main one. We have verapamil and diltiazem, right? Diltiazem. These are an anhydrous uh, calcium channel blockers, all right? They are Associated side effects are majorly two. Uh, patient could present with lower extremity edema and constipation, right? And constipation. We also have some other drugs that can be used to treat antiarrhythmias, but they are not grouped in any traditional classes, all right? And they can be used as standalone drugs, like the digoxin, which is a group of the cardiac glycosides. It majorly works by inhibiting the sodium potassium pump and therefore increases the intracellular calcium, increasing contraction. We also have AV node inhibition. Digoxin has been found to have vagomimetic effects on the AV node. So by stimulating the parasympathetic nervous stimulation, it normally slows down electrical conduction in the atrioventricular node, thereby decreasing the heart rate, right? We can have some facts about digoxin. Of course, we know it's, uh, it comes from the class of cardiac, uh, cardiac glycosides, and we have already said it works by inhibiting the sodium uh, potassium ATPase pump, and this leads to increase in intracellular calcium levels. So this enhances myocardial contractility. Remember, when calcium is there, it will cause the contraction. 
So, it is majorly used in treatment of heart failure, especially in patients with atrial fibrillation, certain arrhythmias like AFib and a flutter. All right. Some of the side effects associated with use of digoxin include the nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, visual disturbances, okay, seeing her loss around the light. It has a narrow therapeutic uh, index, so um, toxicity can easily occur. So this presenting uh, symptoms, and uh, this can present symptoms such as arrhythmias, blood visions, and confusion. So we have to do regular monitoring of serum digoxin levels to avoid toxicity. The, these drugs, you find that it normally interacts with other drugs, especially antibiotics, diuretics, and drugs that affect potassium levels and can alter its efficacy or toxicity. We have some nursing roles that you are supposed to perform. You have to monitor epical pulse uh, for, a, for a full one minute before administering the drug. You have to hold the dose and notify the physician if the pulse is less than 60 beats per minute in an adult or 70 beats in an, a child or 90 beats uh, in an infant. You have to notify the physician promptly of any significant changes in rate, rhythm, and quality of passes. Also remember to check the pulse so that you avoid hypo, hypotension. Another drug is adenosine, which is an endogenous nucleoside, which acts as a potent vasodilator and inhibits conduction through the AV node by activating adenosine receptors. Adenosine is primarily used for termination of supraventricular tachycardia, including paroxysmal uh, supraventricular tachycardia. So it's normally administered typically as a rapid intravenous bolus. It can cause a brief period of asystole or bradycardia upon administration, and then this is followed by restoration of a normal sinus rhythm in patients with, uh, with, with these conditions. Okay, so uh, with patient with par uh, paroxysmal supraventricular uh, tachycardias. So side effects associated with this drug include flushing, chest discomfort, dyspnea, transient hypertension. These effects are usually short-lived because of the the rapid metabolism of adenosine. Adenosine has a very short half-life. All right, it's contraindicated in patients with high degree AV block. Sick uh, sinus syndrome or bronchoconstrictive lung disease, as it may exacerbate these symptoms. Adenosine may interact with other drugs to affect cardiac conduction or additional receptors, potentially altering its effect, uh, its effect or uh, its uh, its effectiveness. The last drug is magnesium sulfate, and magnesium sulfate is a mineral supplement and an electrolyte. It, uh, the mechanism of action actually in arrhythmias is still not very clear. Those studies have found that it uh, acts as a magnesium ion source, which plays a crucial role in various physiological processes, including muscle function, nerve function, and heart rhythm regulation. Magnesium sulfate is used for several purposes, including treatment of magnesium deficiency, preventing and treatment of scissors in patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia, and during a pregnancy as an adjunctive treatment for certain arrhythmias, especially the dosardis, depointes, and refractory ventricular fibrillation. It's normally administered intravenously, can also be intramuscular or orally, depending on the indication and severity. Side effects associated with this one include flushing, warm, uh, warmth, sweating, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness. At higher doses, magnesium sulfate can cause respiratory depression, hypotension, cardiac arrest, and loss of, uh, of, 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 of loss of the reflexes. Okay, loss of the reflexes. So, money you have to keep, you have to do close monitoring of the serum magnesium levels. Uh, renal function, vital signs, which is very necessary so as to prevent toxicity. Magnesium sulfate is contraindicated in patients with severe renal impairment, musthenia gravis, or heart block, as it may exacerbate uh, respiratory depression uh, for the musthenia gravis and also kidney injuries for the for the for the guys who have that impairment magnesium sulfate can also uh, interact with other drugs like the neuromuscular blockers channel blockers to render it uh, to also exacerbate its adverse uh, effects and also to make it less effective
magnesium sulfate has found to be very effective in the treatment of uh, Tosadis depointes, and you can see how Tosadis depointes will appear on our ECG. All right. So, <clears throat> in summary, we have cardiac tissue and arrhythmic drugs. Okay. So, on the senior arterial node, we'll find beta blockers can work there by preventing the sympathetic nervous stimulation. We could also have the sodium channel blockers, that is, uh, that's class 4, and the digoxin, which is uh, on its own classification. AV, we can have class 1C, which are very potent in, in reducing the phase 0, calcium channel blockers, class 4, and beta blockers, class 2, and digoxin. Actual arrhythmias, we could use class 1A, Okay, class 1A, and then 1C, potassium channel blockers, class 3, and beta blockers, class 2. The, for the ventricle, we normally use the sodium channel blockers, uh, which is class A, and then the potassium channel blockers, class 3. Accessory pathways, we could use class 1A and potassium channel blockers, class 3. Right? Okay, guys. So, in summary... Uh, we have those four classes of drugs, okay? We could have the class 1, A, B, C. All of them, they are blocking sodium channels in cardiac cells, prolonging, uh, prolonging the action potential duration. Their major side effect is just the QT prolongation and proarrhythmia and hypotension, all right? While well, class 2 is about better adrenergic receptor blockers, they normally work by reducing sympathetic stimulation of the heart with the side effects with uh, like bradycardia, hypotension, and fatigue. For class 3, they block the potassium channels, and this prolongs the repolarization of cardiac cells. Remember, they work on reducing, uh, reducing prolonging the phase 3, right? Phase 3 on repolarization. Also, the side effects just will include QT prolongation, the saddest the point is, uh, and, and so on. And then lastly, we have the calcium channel blockers, which is class 4, okay? They reduce calcium influx in cardiac cells, slowing the contraction. So, patient will present with bradycardia, hypotension, and constipation. And we only have two examples here. We have verapamil and deltiazem, right? So, that marks... Um, the end of the presentation of antiarrhythmic drugs, okay? The four group of classes, okay? Class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. Guys, you can test your knowledge on this topic by attempting the quizzes in the description section. Otherwise, thank you so much for making time for us. Continue to share with friends and share with us. Comment on our videos so as we can be able to touch more people and become more interactive. Thank you and see you again.